Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar, a big time distribution day for stocks with the S&P closing below 4,200. The Nasdaq down over 2%. Market leaguer Alphabet dropping 10% on an earnings miss. Mary Ellen McGonigal of MEM Investment Research will be joining us from California. Are there any stocks looking good here? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis and featuring the Stock Charts platform. A lot of cool features and a lot of cool tools that you can bring to bear to try to make sense of these markets. When it feels like everything is struggling, when you feel that distribution, when you feel more red than green on the average chart or the average page that you bring up, there is hope. And I would tell you in this sort of environment, two things I would suggest, maybe three. Number one, now is the time to have a high level of situational awareness, right? Situational awareness is that thing where you have a sense of what's happening around you. This is a term I got from being a student pilot where you were taught to never lose your situational awareness. Always have a sense of what's happening around you so that you don't fly into the clouds, fly into a mountain, fly into the ground, any of those things that are going to abruptly end a really fun flight. So improve your situational awareness. Hopefully stock charts can be a part of that situational awareness for you. Number two, focus on relative strength. At times when it feels like everything's starting to roll over, there are still things that are working. And most importantly, there are things that are doing better than our benchmarks. So do a relative strength line using an indicator called price performance on stock charts. Look for things where the slope of that line is going higher. And that tells you even if it's going down, it's outperforming the S&P, outperforming the NASDAQ. Those can be some good opportunities in a, uh, in a down tape. The third thing, now is the time to be using the scanning engine to find stocks that are breaking out, find stocks that are still working, find stocks that are holding support. Use our alert feature to make sure that any sort of stop that you might have in mind, any line in the sand that you don't miss when one of those things is triggered. Now is the time, I would argue, to focus more on capital preservation than capital growth. So make sure that you have a good assessment of risk and use stock charts to hopefully make sure that you're better prepared and again, upgrade that situational awareness. We have a really good guest today, by the way, Mary Ellen McGonigal, one of my favorite pure stock pickers is how I would describe Mary Ellen and her uh, process. So excited to hear what names and what ideas she is coming up with in a challenging market environment. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and see what happened today. Before we get to the charts and the S&P and the NASDAQ in bright red, let's get to a poll question. We asked you recently, which ETF out of these three do you think performs best over the next three months, energy, the XLE, technology, the XLK, or utilities, the XLU. Interesting spread, interesting distribution of votes around these three. None of them getting a majority of the votes, but technology still with 43%. That's a little surprising for me. However, the three-month thing, I think, is probably what, uh, what, what, would, uh, what would lean people into things like technology. You know, you have to remember with charts like Microsoft and Apple dropping, making lower highs, you know, testing support levels, breaking down in a lot of cases. A three-month window means you'd get out of the fourth quarter, we'll get it into the beginning of next year. If Q4 follows any sort of the normal pattern of a uh, seasonality, the seasonal cycles that happen in the fourth quarter, November, probably December are more likely than not going to be a little bit stronger, which means technology could be one of those things to, uh, to lead us out. And if you have to get defensive, Utilities were always one of those sort of go-to defensive plays. Consumer staples, some of those stocks starting to bounce a little bit. Uh, technology, though, arguably kind of the defense, those mega cap technology names. Hard to find a better sort of defensive play than those types of uh, charts. I don't know if I would disagree, but I'd probably vote Energy XLE. Having said that, let's get to our market right recap and see what played out today. As I mentioned, kind of a distribution day. And I don't, some other platforms, some other services, a distribution day has a particular connotation. For me, that is just a general day when things are going down, when it feels like distribution is happening. In, in, in my opinion, accumulation is an uptrend, distribution is a downtrend. And that's how I generally try to frame things out. So with that in mind, the S&P down 1.4%. This hurts, S&P getting back below 4,200, closing around 4,187. Now, that's close to that 4,180 level, which is the 38.2% Fibonacci level. We'll talk about that when we get to the chart of the S&P. We've, we've uh, mentioned that level a number of times. But look at the NASDAQ composite, down over 2%. As a matter of fact, it kind of rolled over going into the close, finishing down 2.4%. Mid-caps 
Small caps all down as well, uh, over one and a quarter to one and a half percent. So certainly a, 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 a distribution day. I think following through on the trend that we've seen here, August, September into October, lower highs, lower lows. This is sort of pressing the lower low and a lot of these charts really uh, you know, starting to accelerate to the downside. A lot of new 52-week lows, if you use our scanning engine, you will, it will not be hard to find stocks making a new low for the year right about now. The VIX on this distribution day pops back above 20. And that was one of those interesting uh, sort of takeaways from yesterday's show. The VIX had actually pulled back uh, below 20 and had gone down in the 19 uh, uh, range. Today kind of popping back up there. And I think the VIX remaining above 20, again, not that it's the most you know, powerful uh, trading system I've ever come up with. But generally speaking, the VIX above 20 for me, high volatility, high risk, high uncertainty. The VIX below 20, people just aren't getting that nervous. There's not a lot of noise, not a lot of volatility. Things are kind of okay. So as the VIX gets above 20, accelerates above there and remains above that level, I think that more and more speaks to a market in a distribution phase. Interest rates overall moving higher, and you can see the 5, 10, 30-year points all pushing to the upside. Uh, the long bond yield is almost to 5.1% as of the close today. The 10-year yield settling in toward the highs of the day around 495, and the 5-year yield around 492. Bond prices, of course, coming off. So the TLT was down 2.2%. Other bond ETFs that we track, like the AG, the LQD, and others uh, all sort of moving lower through the course of the day today. So certainly uh, continue to see rotation away from the bond markets. And, and again, that is causing uh, interest rates to push uh, onward and ever upward, as we like to say. The dollar moving up slightly. The UUP was up about 0.3%, right around $30 for that uh, dollar ETF. The commodity space a little bit mixed here. You actually had gold slightly higher, up about 0.4%. Uh, that's using the GLD, the SLV, which is a silver ETF, down about 0.4%. The broader commodity space did okay, up about 0.7% for the DBC. Crude oil prices pushing uh, back to the upside. Gold is one of those ideas. Yesterday, we had uh, Tom Atkinson on the show from FX Evolution. He had a great chart of gold. Talking about potential short covering, covering a short squeeze that was causing gold prices to accelerate to the upside. But, you know, I think you have to start looking to the left. One of the reasons why this uh, show is called The Final Bar, because when I'm teaching technical analysis, you look at the final bar and then look to the left and see where we're at relative to where we've been. And look at the chart of gold and spot gold on our, uh, on our uh, services, dollar sign G-O-L-D. Uh, you can see we're threatening up to the uh, upper ranges all time, right? Up to $2,000, $2,100 uh, an ounce. Finally, cryptocurrencies continuing to push to the upside. Bitcoin actually having a really strong move, accelerating here over the last week, over the weekend, and now into uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, pushing to the upside, uh, you know, right around 35,000, uh, sort of briefly, I think briefly, yeah, briefly getting above there earlier, uh, earlier today. GBTC is, well, you know, probably the closest thing you can come up with to a, uh, to a Bitcoin ETF listed here in the U.S. If you're in Canada, there are some Bitcoin ETFs that you have access to. But for U.S.-based investors, you can either do a Bitcoin future ETF or something like the GBTC, which is more of a trust, kind of like an ETF, but it's not exactly it. You know, I think the speculation that we would have, uh, you know, additional uh, access for uh, investors, particularly advisors, institutional investors, and a lot of uh, other individual investors. And ETF just makes that market more accessible. Arguably, this is uh, you're seeing the potential upside as things like Bitcoin become more and more widely accepted. And I don't know widely understood because I would argue there's still a big gap between what Bitcoin is and how much people are actually familiar with it. Finally, sectors. A very defensive feel to the tape again today in terms of the sector distribution. At the top of the list, you have utilities up half a percent. Number two, consumer staples up 0.4 percent. In a minute here, we'll look at the uh, relative performance of offense over defense. It has been favoring the XLY or the uh, consumer discretionary sector for quite some time. You're starting to see some of the consumer staple stocks, while still overall a lot of them going down, they're starting to see a bit of a, a mean reversion. I know uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal has a staples name to, uh, to talk about when we bring her on in a bit, so I'll save any further conversation, but certainly seeing a bit of a rotation to defensive energy and financials rounding out the uh, top, top four. On the bottom, we had a big issue there with Alphabet missing earnings, not a particularly uh, rosy picture that they were painting uh, about, uh, about the future of Alphabet, at least in terms of the quarterly earnings report. This is moving the XLC down 4.3%. Again, that is in no small part, or, or arguably mostly because of one of the biggest names in the sector and the biggest names in the market uh, rotating lower, uh, down almost 10% today. 
real estate, the XLRE, and consumer discretionary rounding out the bottom three, both down over 2% today. So again, you know, is it the end of the world that utilities is at the top of the list? No. And there have actually been periods when the market has rallied and utilities have actually been quite strong. But that's kind of the exception. That's not the rule. I tend to think of something like utilities. I mean, name five utility stocks. And if you're someone like Mary Ellen or me or a, someone who's looked at a lot of stocks, you probably could come up with five. But for the average investor, I, you may be hard pressed to come up with one or two of them. Maybe the one that you use in your house or your apartment. But that's the thing, right? These are not sexy, well-known companies, but they're stable, they're low volatility, and they're good places to ride out uh, periods of uncertainty. So, you know, noticeably uh, at the top of the list yet again today. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. You'll see how we rotated lower today. And again, a number of things concern me about today's session. Number one, we are finally at that 4180 level. That's the 38.2% retracement of the way down. If you take the July peak from a couple months ago, take the October 2022 low, which is around 3500. 38.2% of the way is around 4180. Now, what's interesting about that level, as we've mentioned, is there are a number of other things kind of all in that same range, what I would call a confluence of support. You have the 200-day moving average, which is just above there, around 4230, 4235. We have the 4200 level, which was the peak in February of, uh, of this year, served as resistance a number of months later before we finally broke out. We actually bounced off of this uh, purple shaded area right around 4180 to 4220. Uh, earlier in October, we're now there again. And as of today, closing uh, right at the lower end of that range, kind of closing right at 4180. So, you know, as we've mentioned on the show, I see this as a distribution uh, in, in play in, in progress. Lower highs and lower lows are the most important thing. We've made a lower high at a descending 50-day moving average. Now we're making a lower low. We can speculate on what sort of downside objectives may make sense. But in my opinion, objectives, right? Price targets are fine in terms of something to think about, but in terms of what is going to help me invest better or focus on opportunities, I'd much rather follow the trend than make a decision based on some target that may or may not be hit. So overall, I'm seeing this as a market in a downtrend. And, you know, again, as I was mentioning to my premium members earlier uh, today in a market update, I think in a bullish phase, you consider the market innocent until proven guilty. I would argue now we've kind of flipped, right? You think of this chart as guilty until proven innocent. What would you need to see to convince you that this is no longer a downtrend? I would argue a lot more than what we've seen here uh, so far this week. Let's look to some of the individual names. Uh, I don't often get a chance. I usually have a lot of ideas of stocks to look at, and then I never get enough time to or make myself enough time to, uh, to get to them. So I do want to highlight some of these just because we're in the midst of a heavy earnings period. Last week, this week, next week, this is sort of the bulk of earnings season. A lot of uh, market cap represented on an average uh, day here, particularly the middle of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today, certainly quite a lot of, uh, of names to talk about. Alphabet and Microsoft were right after the close yesterday. Let's talk about both of those here very quickly. So Alphabet, of course, we've talked about this name so many times, and I've, I've brought this up relentlessly because I what, what I recognized was as the market was rotating lower, as the s and is making lower highs and lower lows, Alphabet was very uh, clearly not doing so, right? It was going up. It was making higher highs and higher lows. It was above an upward sloping moving average. That's a chart in a pretty good, uh, pretty good shape. That's changed now. As of today, we've gapped down. And what was interesting is earlier today, we kind of traded lower. Stocks started to bounce up a little bit. One of the things I was thinking was, do you see investors buying in on the weakness in Alphabet? Are investors so excited about picking up Alphabet $15 cheaper than it was a couple weeks ago and be being able to expect that further upside? That's not what you got through the course of the day. It actually went back and uh, ended up uh, finishing the day at the lows for the, uh, for the session. Not that I want to draw too many long-term conclusions from the short-term movement today, but I would certainly say a gap lower and then additional distribution through the course of the day tells me a lot, I think, about the short-term sentiment, which, again, tilting kind of negative. At this point, I would say this is a, uh, you know, a chart in a, in a bit of a distribution. You know, the, the, the question would be, when we rally, do we make a lower high? Where does that end up? And that's often one of those great confirmations that the trend is now uh, lower, the primary trend is now lower. Microsoft, obviously, another one. Now, this is a little different. You know, yesterday, to summarize earnings after the close, Thumbs up for Microsoft, thumbs down for Alphabet. That's my general, there's your uh, cliff notes for what happened uh, after, the, after the close yesterday. But look at what happened with Microsoft. Microsoft and Spotify, which is another name we'll, uh, I'll show you in a minute. 
gapped higher, right? Great news overall. The report was fairly constructive at a time when a lot of earnings had been uh, underwhelming. Microsoft with the Azure service, the cloud uh, computing, kind of encouraging report seemed pretty optimistic. So the stock gapped higher. But look what happened through the course of the day. You actually traded lower through the course of the day. So in a bullish phase, a lot of times you get these gaps higher and then you get people that are still thrilled to own a Microsoft, even though it's jumped about $15 a share, it's still a good opportunity because you're betting on that long-term potential. We saw the opposite. We saw Microsoft actually selling off. And at the end of the day, we came right back to resistance at the September peak. So while it was great that the company uh, beat earnings, the fact that buyers are not coming in and adding Microsoft after that jump tells me a lot about the, uh, the short-term sentiment again, which I feel is uh, kind of negative. Spotify is another one, right? Nice earnings when you can see yesterday, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit to uh, a chart that just focuses on the, uh, the short-term day-to-day movements. This was yesterday's trade where you jumped higher, closed around 154 and change, opened at 164. So a big jump overnight, traded higher through the course of the day. Today, we opened a little bit lower and then actually went below yesterday's trading range. So all that optimism around a good earnings uh, an earnings beat actually was given back and then some, right? So we're kind of back into the range of this uh, gap. So stocks that are actually doing well, companies that are doing well that I'm seeing gap higher, I'm concerned about the distribution that we're uh, seeing through the course of the day here and, and through the course of this week. Now, where could there be opportunities? Let's talk about a couple charts here to finish off our market recap. You know, stocks like Visa, not, you know, is this the best chart I've ever seen in the history of, of looking at charts? No. Is it not going down as much as a lot of other names? Absolutely. Is it for now finding support at the 200 day moving average? Is it actually trading higher through the course of the day? All of those things are true. But what I mentioned earlier, remember what I mentioned in the intro about things to think about and how I would generally approach it, the relative strength line on a stock like Visa, because it is holding up. It's not making a lower low at the moment. It's actually holding up at the 200-day. Stocks that are holding support are, by definition, going to be uh, outperforming at a time when our benchmarks are not doing so. I think that uh, Visa could be at an interesting uh, point. Holding the 200-day, I would say, pretty important. And these swing lows here around 227, 228, probably important to, uh, to watch as well. After the close today, we have a couple names coming out here. Meta Platforms down 4% today, but they're reporting uh, after the close. Another one I would keep an eye on is KLAC. The semiconductor space, of course, has been you know, particularly strong at times, but in the last couple months, we're starting to see a bit of a distribution here. You're seeing KLAC with a lower high, right around $500 earlier this month. Now we're rotating lower. If they miss earnings, do it, does it hold the September low? Does it hold the 200-day moving average? That would be my question on charts like this. A lot of other names reporting earnings. Don't forget about our earnings calendar. If you go to charts and tools on the right column, you'll see the earnings calendar. Great way of planning ahead, thinking about when stocks you may be interested in are reporting earnings, and then you can be better prepared for whatever comes next. That's our market recap for today. I'm going to bring on today's guest, Mary Ellen McGonigal, in just a moment. Before I do so, just to remind you, our mailbag, always open. The chat is open right at the moment. You are welcome to use our live chat feature during the show. Just put a question in there. If we don't get to it during the live broadcast, we will put those in the mailbag. We will be doing a mailbag segment on Friday show. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Besides using the live chat, you can also put a comment right below the uh, video you're watching on our YouTube channel or email always works. The final bar at stockcharts.com. We would so love to hear from you. I want to welcome on today's guest, Mary Ellen McGonigal. Mary's the president of MEM Investment Research, coming to us from Santa Monica, California, a longtime friend to Stock Charts TV, a Stock Charts contributor. And Mary Ellen, you and I actually started working with Stock Charts right around the same time, and it's so good to see you. How have you been? Great. Yes, and it's wonderful to see you as well. And it's, interestingly, we did meet many years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And, and as I've mentioned many times, people should know how graciously I, I basically uh, pinged you and said, I'm coming to L.A. Is there any way we could meet up? And you said, absolutely. We had a great time. And, and it's, uh, it was Wonderful. the beginning of a great relationship that I'm very thankful for. You shared a couple charts with us. I, this environment is challenging. I've mentioned sort of, you know, this market in distribution mode. Would you agree with that assessment or how are you thinking of as we're starting to see a little more of a risk off feel to the tape here. Yeah, we've actually already, we're beginning to see a risk off sentiment take shape. This is something I talked about in my Sunday MEM Edge report. The fact that there was most definitely a move away from these 
tech names. We were beginning to see softening among semiconductors, software names, even though they were coming in with good numbers. And then you can look beyond that at small caps and biotech names. So really suffering, indicating, again, that risk off sentiment among investors, and then also the volatility with that VIX spiking up above 20. So I, I mentioned in the introduction, is there anything that is working? And you, you brought a couple charts with you. I'd love to go through each of these because what's so funny is, uh, and I know from years of reading IBD, which I know you're familiar with, of course, working with, uh, with Will O'Neill for, for a number of years, there are always stocks somewhere that are kind of working. It's just a question of finding them. Now, consumer staples have been a particularly weak part of the market, but your first stock is General Mills. Why does this seem like an interesting opportunity here? Yeah, so generally or normally I am not driven to staples or utilities, but you cannot look the other way and ignore mm -hmm. this chart. What we are seeing is a stock that today has broken above that key 50-day simple moving average. So what I've done is highlighted other downtrend reversal attempts back in July and then more recently at the beginning of October. And the big difference with this downtrend reversal attempt, we're not quite all the way there yet, is that that RSI is now up there in positive territory. We've had that take shape. Also, the MACD trending higher. And if you were to pull up a weekly chart, you would see that General Mills is in the most overbought position. You'd have to go back to serious 08, 09 type bear markets to see a similar oversold position on the RSI. So a couple of factors technically looking at the chart that make it quite attractive. The company did come out with earnings in September. They were above estimates and they did keep their guidance the same going forward. True to other staples names, they've been able to raise their prices, a little bit of resistance, but not a lot. So they do still have sales in place. And again, uh, and they also do offer a nice 3.2% yield and that multiple, it's trading at 15 times. The other factor I need to see is other names in the group faring well. And we did mm. see Pepsi and Coke. They both came out with numbers recently that were above estimates. And both of those companies guided their growth estimates higher going into next year. So you have a little bit of a growth component. And then of course, a nice defensive play in a very difficult period. Yeah, great chart. I brought up that weekly chart as you were talking, Marianne. I see what you're saying about the RSI. The, this is the weekly RSI now becoming oversold actually for you know for the last couple of months, and then just kind of coming out of that uh, out of that oversold region. Can you talk briefly about in your process when you're looking at a chart like GIS? How do you think about the long term, the weekly chart versus the short term, the daily chart? Does one supersede the other? Do you see them as complementary? Like, how do you sort of use those multiple time frames. Very complimentary. Great, great question. So I, with my, again, MEM Edge report, I do favor growth stocks. And I have been in and out of names such as NVIDIA. I put that on the suggested holdings list in January. We held on to that for about six months. I removed it from the suggested holdings list on a break below key support. However, I did suggest stay with it longer term. And that was all about using that weekly chart as your guide mm. to give you that outlook going beyond just these near-term moves that are really prevalent this year. This has been a really dicey choppy year for the markets. It, it's been uh, it's been noisy for sure. Great great thought about how to think about the long term, the, the weekly perspective. Your second mm -hmm. name going to the financial sector, insurance stocks. I mean, out of the financial sector, insurance probably the best position in terms of you know not going down to the severity of some of the the bigger banks. What attracts you to a progressive here? Yeah, so we can see it's really ignoring what's taking place elsewhere in the markets, and there are a number of reasons for that. This is a product insurance. If we think with Progressive, it's going to be auto as well as home insurance, and that's going to be needed regardless of the economy. Uh, the other factor here, we did have this company recently report earnings. Take a look at that gap up, super big volume. And subsequent to that, and this is all about the company coming in with excellent earnings, guiding growth higher. They're looking for very big growth into next year. So the, this is another company similar to those staples. They've been able mm. to increase their rates 
Auto insurance rates are up 20 or 19% this year. Unfortunately, we need to bite the bullet and pay for that. But the other mm -hmm. big factor with these insurance companies is they take your premiums and invest them in short-term investments. And that can be anywhere from a three-month treasury out to a two-year bond. And you're looking at about a 5% annualized rate that they are getting on this money. And that is the secondary big reason that these companies come in with these good numbers and they have excellent cash flow. Uh, mm. Progressive does as well. They're also very technologically advanced. They take the information from their clients and utilize that and slice it and dice it to really help them set rates and also uh, pivot as far as uh, more recently, it's been really expensive for these auto insurers to replace and repair particular uh, bumpers and so forth, but they have been able to sidestep that uh, in, in other ways. It's a great chart. Again, it just, it strikes me how different this chart of PGR and some of the other insurance providers looks relative to the average stock right now, which has had a pretty tough uh, uh, go of things here in recent, recent months. So, uh, you know, defensive play consumer staples makes a ton of sense to me, given the market environment. Something like progressive insurance, kind of a defensive part of financials. So I'm scratching my head a bit at chart number three, which is a retailer and consumer <laughs> discretionary. Talk to us about Urban Outfitters and why you think this is a decent time for this name. Absolutely. Yeah. So what we are looking at here, of course, is an, a company that provides clothing and uh, accessories to a very particular clientele. And their average cl uh, customer is going to be anywhere from age 12 to 22, a real sweet spot for them. What we are seeing within retail, the retail group overall, no doubt, is in a very much of a downtrend. But Urban Outfitters would be in line with Abercrombie & Fitch, mm. American Eagle. These are names that are hitting new highs because they are addressing that very vibrant market. Urban Outfitters more recently has branched out. They now have a rent to wear division that's continuing to grow. And if we look at this chart, you can see that it has broken above resistance, above that 50 day simple moving average. We have a nice positive RSI and MACD and a golden cross formation with that 10 day going up through the 50 day. But again, that the relevance and re is going to be the vibrancy that we are seeing elsewhere in this very select area. Also, we did see a nice jump in September retail sales mm. last week, and that was all about online sales. And that's another specialty with Urban Outfitters and their customer direct basis. And also one other thing that I think we chatted about briefly before the show was this concept that that sweet age group is going to have income regardless of the economy. It's going to be by way of an allowance, babysitting, and they are going to have a bit more of discretionary income. They're not going to be quite as impacted by their parents by inflation. Yeah. I, as I mentioned before, Mr. and Mrs. Keller are still looking for date nights anytime we can score them. So I don't think babysitting is going to change anytime soon. Great argument. Uh, great argument for that one. You had mentioned we were talking before the show about how retailers like this have often, often done better at times when you wouldn't expect them to. You mentioned a, a previous recessionary period. Can you tell us a little Absolutely. bit more about that? I thought that was a really good point. Yes. So uh, in that, I'm taking you back to the early 1990s. We did have a very brief recessionary period. However, retailers similar to Urban Outfitters were skyrocketing. You can look at GPS, uh, Gap would be a good example. And other uh, coach no longer, unfortunately, they mm. have been melted into tapestry, so we can't get a chart there. But these are companies that, despite economic strife, were faring well. And again, at that time, the argument was because these younger individuals have this discretionary income that they can put to work. Yeah, you can see this is the weekly chart of Gap. You can see this brilliant move higher, 1990 into Huge. 1991. Huge. Incredible yeah. run during a, a sketchy time in, in, uh, in equity history, uh, for sure. Can we talk a little about just with the, the time we have left here, just a, a minute or two, Mary Ellen, when you're looking at the overall market, you know, we mentioned sort of a market in distribution, right? You're seeing the S&P back below its 200-day moving average. While we could find a floor here sometime soon, it certainly isn't happening today. Can you talk a little bit about what 
that means for you and how you approach these markets. You're still finding ideas, but do you tend to add or subtract general risk based on the overall market environment? Or are you sort of market agnostic and just looking for good ideas in any environment? Well, I can tell you that personally, I am 90% in cash. That tends to be mm. where I go if the markets are stumbling and there's that much uncertainty, volatility is high. And so that's one, uh, as it relates to subscribers to my MEM Edge report last week, I did have four names, that's very small, on the suggested holdings list, but I did not indicate them as being in a buy zone. I suggested, as I have over the last three to four weeks, to not put money to work during this current market environment. Yeah, see, seems like we have not quite found a floor yet, certainly today, finishing near the lows maybe further downside to be had. But Mary Ellen, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for what you've done, I think, to teach so many how to apply the technical toolkit consistently. And uh, be well. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Great. Good to see you, Dave. That's Mary Ellen McGonigal. Mary's the, Mary Ellen is the president of MEM Investment Research, coming to us from uh, Santa Monica. And again, just a, a really warm and nice human being, but really knowledgeable about the markets. I love talking with Mary Ellen about individual names. She is an encyclopedia of knowledge on some of these uh, uh, stocks and industries. But what's encouraging to me, and I was wondering, I was sort of like keeping an eye shut as I looked at the email she was sending earlier today, some of the charts she was looking at. Sure enough, in a challenging tape, she's able to find a couple names to uh, focus on. Great take there uh, by Mary Ellen McGonigal of MEM Investment Research. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, I feature this, I did a webcast yesterday called Another October Low, where we focused on some of the signs uh, looking at seasonality, but also some of the evidence that we see right now. The market has often bottomed in October. That's something I'm aware of. But what would we need to see to sort of confirm that a bottom has happened? And one of the things that I was looking for in terms of sign of that not happening, a sign of further deterioration would be defensive sectors really starting to perform better. We really have not seen that to a large scale in 2023. And this is one of my favorite ratios or sets of ratios to look at. The XLY versus the XLP, so things you want versus things you need. In the bottom half, we're doing an equal weighted version of those two using some equal weighted consumer ETFs. And that's sort of to take the Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot effect out and look at more of the average stock in each sector. Both of these this week actually breaking down a bit, making a new swing low. We'll see how the rest of this week plays out. But this is the first time in a while that I've seen these ratios rotate a little bit more to the defensive side. I want to see a little bit more to sort of confirm that that's not just a one-off sort of move. But overall, you're just starting to see some defensive areas of the market perform a lot better than they have so far in 2023. Chart number two, Visa. We mentioned in our market recap some of those names that are uh, able to hold up. And, I, and when I'm thinking of uh, you know, names like Tesla in a clear consolidation pattern, the question was, does it hold the bottom level of that range? It didn't. It actually broke down below there. Names like Las Vegas Sands and others, right? A clear neckline broken. The S&P itself breaking a neckline. Visa still kind of holding in there. And I'm looking at the 200-day moving average, which served as support in September and October. I'm seeing that same sort of bounce off of there. If you know your candle patterns, this is the gravestone doji, which is actually when you have a uh, open and close at the lows and actually a uh, long upper shadow. In this sort of environment, actually usually suggests uh, indecision, a bit of an upside reversal at the 200-day. And that's what we're seeing so far this week. Chart number three, Bitcoin. We didn't get a chance to get into uh, cryptocurrencies with my guest today, Mary Ellen McGonigal, but we, had a, we were chatting a little bit before we went live about uh, Bitcoin. Some of the uh, factors at play here with you know, Bitcoin ETF, certainly speculation of those getting approved, certainly feels like we are moving to some Goldilocks moment of some regulation, but not a crippling amount of uh, the opportunity for additional investors to gain access to this market. And you're seeing the price really move higher. The GBTC, one of those uh, you know, trusts that are actually doing quite well, spot Bitcoin, for lack of a better term, trading up to 35,000. What I wanted to note here is if you take the all-time high in the fourth quarter of 21, take the low from the fourth quarter of last year, 38.2% of the way is just below 36,000. And that's right about where we're at. I'm very keen to see if we can break above that first Fibonacci level. That has seemed a long way away until this week. 
Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. A special thank you to Mary Ellen McGonigal of MEM Investment Research joining us from California. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.